everyone, and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of Falcon 2024 here at the Aria in Las Vegas. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, alongside my co-host and co-analyst, Dave Vellante. We have with us Clark Rogers. He is the director, AWS Enterprise Strategy at AWS. Welcome to theCUBE, Clark. Good afternoon, and what about all this energy here at Falcon? It's amazing. You know, it's a post-lunch. Usually there's a <laughs> lull, but right now there's a buzz. There's, there's happening conversations taking place it's all over, including right on this stage. Absolutely. So one of the things we've been talking about a lot here is, is a culture of security and how critical that is, not only for cybersecurity professionals like yourself, but just really within organizations as a whole. So how do you describe the, the, culture, culture, secure, the culture of security at AWS and, and, and what lessons can other organizations learn from, from what you do to cultivate that? For sure, so um, culture of security I, I think is, it's, it's part of our DNA at AWS specifically. Uh, if, it's, if, if we're not talking about security first, there's a problem, right? So it's everything from the CEO on down. There's a weekly CEO CISO meeting, right, where they talk about security. When I talk to a lot of our customer uh, CISOs, which I spend most of my time doing, they're like, you have a whole hour with the CEO? <laughs> Well, what that does is not only is it a, a good venue for the CEO and the CISO to have a discussion about all things uh, security, but it sets the tone from the top to everyone in the organization that security is important. As you can imagine, the CEO of AWS is a very busy person. To take an hour out of his week to do that, it me means a lot. So what that does, that rolls down through the entire organization. So whether you're a security badged person or you're a developer, or whatever your role is, you know that security is important. In the uh, business meetings, down at the, you know, at, the, at the product level and things like that, the product owner kicks off the meetings of how are we doing with security with, with our product in this release, as well as that product owner owns you know, the P&L for the business, the marketing for the business, et cetera. But we really focus on making that security ownership is distributed throughout the entire organization and that's just one aspect of building a strong culture of security. Well, I will say this. Um, we at theCUBE and theCUBE Research and SiliconANGLE, one of our founding principles was we want to deliver more value to our audience than we extract. And I think when it comes to security, Amazon can say the same thing. Uh, I, I'm, I've been to every reinforce, me and Steven uh, Schmidt, probably, <laughs> you know, I'm sure there are others, uh, but it really, uh, that sentiment comes through there. It's not, it's not a big revenue maker for you. You got some products that you sell, but you, your culture is, it's built in from the start. You get it, you just get it. And so that's something I've always liked about uh, Amazon's strategy. I wonder if you could comment on, on that, and you know, was that by accident or was that by design? It, it was extremely purposeful, right? So it's, uh, we, we are famous for our leadership principles. One of them is earned trust, right? And as we all know, trust is uh, very easy, I'm sorry, it's very difficult to gain, but very easy to lose, mm -hmm. right? So uh, back when, when Andy Jassy and team were uh, releasing AWS, they realized if we don't do security right and we lose that trust with the customer, we'll be out of business, right? So security was drilled in as very, very important from day one of AWS and it continues to be through this day. And as I mentioned earlier, at all levels of the organization, whether you're security badged or not. Well, uh, Werner Vogels uses this concept often, he invokes of uh, well-architected. Right. So what is well-architected security? What's good security look like? So it, it, it's, it's, it won't be anything strange to any of our uh, customer CISOs or security professionals. You know, there, there's layers of security from a technical perspective. Um, the trickier bit, in my opinion, is really back to that culture of security. So when the security organization and the quote unquote business come together and realize security is my strategic enabler, right? Security allows me to, strong security, allows me to innovate faster, delight my customers, release more products to market, outpace my competitor, that's when the magic happens, when both the, the business side realizes that security is valuable and security is bringing that value to the table. Uh, it's, it's unfortunately a bad, um, it, it, it's a myth where the CISO is looked at the department of no, no you can't do that, it's too risky from a security perspective. 
Today we have our CISOs who are saying yes, but, right? We'll do anything you want business, right? We'll build this, we'll do that. I just need you to understand some of the risks that are out there and the mitigants we need to put in place in order to make things successful, right? Uh, it's, it's that magic that happens along with the technical implementations that you'd have within a large enterprise that really makes security strong. Okay, so it's not no, but it's yes, but what? You might have to wait until you get your ducks in line, and then it's yes, is it that could right? Be, it, it could be that, or it's let's make sure you understand the risks of what's going on, right? right. So it, if, if we go back 10 or 12 years ago, the, the hot thing then was cloud, right? And businesses were like, we want to move to cloud, we want to do all these cool things, innovate, all this kind of stuff. And you had some CSOs who said, no, that's, that's too risky, I'm not going to allow it. And what happened? There was an end run around them, all of a sudden their business is in the cloud, and now they're having to tack on security after the fact, which we all know is not the ideal uh, situation. Fast forward to 18, 24 months ago, the businesses are like, hey, I want to go to Gen AI, right? I want to leverage all these capabilities and make my business move faster. What are the CISOs saying now? Yes, we will do that. Let's all understand that there are some risks involved here. We're going to work together to mitigate them to the degree that it's important for you know, our risk posture, and then let's move forward together. It's the right? lawyers that are saying no now. Well, this is, this <laughs> but is but it's, 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 it's really important. Yeah. It's, been an, yeah. it's, a, it's an evolution of, of the sort of security persona, and then the, yeah. the security culture is out there. And you know, just one more bit on Gen AI real quick. Sure. When you think about some of the more established institutions that are out there, your large financial services companies, your healthcare, et cetera, they're highly regulated, right? So over the years, they spent a lot of money and resources to make sure they have strong security programs, strong compliance programs, they understand what risk is, they know how to mitigate it. They're the ones who have been able to take advantage of Gen AI the fastest. When I look at all the customers that I deal with and I meet with hundreds of years, excuse me, <clears throat> the ones that have made those investments are the ones who can say, yes, let's go try that and see if it works for us and let's move forward. The ones that haven't, it's a much more difficult conversation and it might be, we're ready in six months to test that, right? So it, it, it's a different paradigm completely. So in terms of what you're talking about, you've talked a lot about the modeling that needs to come down from leadership and, and the idea that this is, this is mission critical for our organization, I'm devoting time to it, right. and that will, trickle down to the rest of the organization, the rest of the organization sees that, understands that. But it, it, it can't just be a leadership thing. It really needs to be peer to peer. So how do you encourage that kind of learning and that kind of networking that you described too about learning from your customers? Certainly, so I, I would argue that everyone's a leader, right? So re regardless of what your rank is in the organization. Excellent you, point, you, yes. You have an opportunity to lead from a security perspective. So if, if, if we shift to our sort of customer base, um, that is the one thing that the consistently our customers are most interested in. They get, and you know, we're at, we're at Falcon, they understand they need endpoint security, right? They understand they need to have best of breed uh, firewall rules, all that good stuff from a technical perspective. What they ask is, how can we emulate some of the security culture? So we've developed a program called AWS CISO Circles which we bring in CISOs from around the globe, different industries, it, it's a global program, and we bring them sort of birds of a feather. It's uh, Chatham House rule, so what is said in there stays in there. But what it, what it allows them to do, uh, and when I was, as a former customer, I loved learning from CISOs outside of my industry, right? You seem to learn a lot more that way. Uh, we bring them into a room, and we're having conversations around reporting cybersecurity to the board, right? Uh, diverse hiring practices, right? You, you, don't, you, you may not realize that that HR professional may be your next best security hire, right? It's things like that that they want to go through and they say, well how do I make security important in my business? So we have those discussions and uh, people are very frank and open, they're like, I've run into this problem and the person across the room says I have the same problem and at the end of the day they walk, around, they, they walk away not only with a strong networking experience, but now they can go take back things to their organizations and implement them and, and again, build that stronger security culture within their organizations so they can move faster. So is it a myth that you got to have, be highly technical to be in the cybersecurity business? 
The, the security environment today is so diverse that we can take anyone and find, virtually anyone, and find a role for them in cybersecurity. I, I mentioned the HR professional, which a lot of people will be like, how would, we, how would an HR person be in security? Well, what do HR professionals know very well? They know humans. They know how humans think. They know what motivates humans, what uh, makes uh, humans walk away from certain things. So maybe they could be a, your next great threat analyst, right? So when you're looking at human behaviors either within your organization to see is somebody trying to exfiltrate data or something like that, what do those patterns look like? That HR person might be, might be that next great security hire. John Sapp today from Mutual Insurance yep. said his number one challenge was the human aspect. Mm -hmm. bad, bad human behavior beats good security every time. There's your, there's your perfect example. And, and a lot of professions don't realize that there may be a path forward to security. Look, again, financial analysts. How is that going to help security? But again, patterns, numbers, pattern recognition, they could be your next great SOC analyst. So when, what I challenge my uh, customer CISOs to do is attend the town hall of your local uh, you know, HR gathering within your company or your finance gathering and say, let me tell you about some cool stuff in security, what we're looking for, and yeah, poach them from other people within your organization. <laughs> yeah. Because it, you know, I've yet to meet a CISO who says I have enough security people. Right? Right. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen at AWS, it doesn't happen at CrowdStrike, it doesn't happen anywhere, right? So what you need to do is uh, expand that security knowledge throughout your organization, regardless of what, or, uh, what, um, what org they are in, whether they're security or not, and make them your security eyes and ears throughout the org. Well, you've just made a compelling argument for why, why an HR professional or a financial analyst should, should could have a future in cybersecurity. What's your pitch to them? Why is it a great job? Great question. I, uh, as, a, as, a, as a veteran uh, in the United States Marine Corps, I have this sort of feeling about protection, right? And a lot of people in security either are, are former veterans or have that idea that we want to protect, we want to serve, we want to stop the bad things from happening. A lot of people have that sort of missionary uh, bent in them, for lack of a better word and they may have gone a path, down a path in their careers where they said this is what I've wanted to do, but then there may be a, you know, a higher calling. Like again, that sort of mission driven day-to-day um, uh, -day combat, for lack of a better word, with our adversaries. So you, know, you, you can appeal to that sort of sense in the person, say hey, and cybersecurity is not a low paying career either, right? It may be that path forward that they just didn't know was open to them. Excellent, excellent. Well, well by the way, Thank you for your service. Um, I want to ask you about um, industry collaboration. I mean, years ago there were efforts you know, to kind of keep the data to yourself, maybe even monetize it. Um, we're seeing better collaboration, but I'd like to understand the state of that. We, we saw last week we were out here, Larry Ellison and Matt Garman up on stage, the border war between AWS and Oracle has ended. It was all lovey-dovey, it was awesome. Love to see that because it's customer obsessed. What is the state of collaboration across the industry? Hyperscalers, uh, large you know, financial institutions, big companies that have a, a strong security chops. How is the industry collaborating to help defend? So, uh, you know, broadly speaking, as you, as you uh, can imagine, there are threat intel sharing mechanisms between the, the, the large providers. Uh, but if we, if we go back to our customers, right? When I speak to a customer, I realize that they may not be all in on AWS. They may have an on-prem uh, capability, they may be using other clouds, they may be using other SaaS providers. So when I talk to them about security, I don't specifically go down the AWS path that you need service X and Y and it needs to be configured this way. I want them to be thinking about their entire security program. So a lot of the things we talked about today, getting that business buy-in, being able to report to the board, making sure that your entire program covers your entire estate. Now, a lot of those principles that we have in AWS, you can take those principles and then the customer sort of needs to match it up with the capabilities of some of the other clouds or their on-prem uh, capabilities. But at the end of the day, I want them to be as secure across their entire estate in addition to uh, the AWS platform as well. Excellent. Well, Clark, thank you so much for coming on theCUBE. A really fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for Great having me. Great to have you.
I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante. Keep it right here on theCUBE. We'll be back with more of our live coverage from Falcon 2024. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.